come through in perfect formation. The green flag waves and the 2015 season is underway as well. Abu Dhabi-based engineer and avid racer Jonathan Mullen leads an amateur racing team to take on one of the toughest endurance races on the planet, the Dubai 24 Hours. ZNet Racing Team consists of motorsport enthusiasts from every inhabited continent of the world. The team must quickly gel together to take on this mammoth task. I think the 24 hours is like no other race you will ever do. It really, really takes it out of everyone. We won't sleep much before the event, we won't sleep at all during the event. There will be a lot of stresses, there will be a lot of incidents that will happen. We don't know, we can't plan for those. But really the buzz when you're on the grid, when there's a hundred other cars at the same time, when the lights go out, this is fantastic. Endurance racing, you've got to be here, you soak up the atmosphere, the strategy, the heartache, the joy. You know, it's a bit like a marathon, it's an extreme form of sport. You've got, you know, cars going around for 24 hours, drivers putting everything on the line. It's a tough, tough event. They race for their honour. Uh, if, you, if you win the 24 hour race of Dubai, or even if you win class in the 24 hour race, then you ask somebody, you go home with a very nice uh, cup, there's no prize money. It's the biggest endurance race in the region and in the whole of Asia really. It ranks right up there with the Le Mans 24 hour, the, the Daytona 24 hour, Spa 24 hours. You have a field where of the 80, 60 are very high level competitors uh, and no one is in it just to, to be part of it, they're in it to win it. I think the works teams or the quasi works teams are always going to be the favourites. Um, who are all running very, very highly prepared motor cars. And there are other people who have managed to cobble something together that will last the distance. Yes, we would like to finish on the podium, top step if, if possible. But we have to remember we are fundamentally a bunch of amateurs. We all have day jobs, except for two or three, we're not mechanics by profession. So we don't work in the industry. Long-term Dubai resident, Pakistani advertising executive Umair Khan is the most experienced member of the team. With 17 years of racing experience and six 24-hour races already under his belt, including a Class 2 win in 2013 and three consecutive wins in the UAE Touring Car Championship, Umair's expertise is highly valued among team members. Mainly now I'm focusing on endurance racing because what I find in endurance racing is it's not only racing, there's a lot of uh, other things involved, teamwork, uh, a lot of preparation goes into that. It's not a 20 minute race, it's a 24 hour race but it literally takes 24 months to prepare for it. Preparation is vital. If you're not prepared for this race, if you don't have every box ticked before you arrive here, you're not in the game because you know, the bar has, has, has risen substantially over the years. The smallest mistake, the smallest oversight will be punished. That's kind of the joy of this race. Even if you're a Quasiworks team, even if you have all the power in the world, even if you have crack drivers and ace mechanics, it can all go horribly egg-shaped and you could find yourself sitting in the sidelines while somebody who's spent much less money and has much less experience and probably much less time, um, runs away with the prizes. But to run away with any prize, the team must first build the perfect car. You've got to build the car to full speed for 24 hours. It's much harder on the car. You've got a much higher fuel consumption. So I mean, that's what I'm sat on here. This is a fuel cell. Originally, it would be much smaller. This is a 120 litre fuel tank. So we can do, fingers crossed, two hours between fuel legs. 
race cars have to go fast, they've also got to stop fast. But stopping fast wears out the brakes. We don't want to be changing pads every couple of hours like we would do, so we've got uh, big brake setup, very thick calipers, very thick pads, so it gives us a lot more margin for wear so we can run a lot longer between changing pads. You know, you've got to be careful how you tune the engine. You don't want to tune the engine like a drag car because it'll blow up after 20 laps. We know we've got a good engine in the car and we've got a good spare because you know it happens that you have to change the engine in the middle of a race. I've been there, you know, leading and then you blow an engine. So that's it, change an engine. Hours, hour gone, your lead is gone completely. You know, no driver in the world can make up an hour. The only professional driver in the team hails from the other side of the world. 32-year-old racing driver and mechanic, Gerard McLeod from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, well, being born into a racing uh, family, a heavily involved racing family, my career started when I was a baby really, but uh, following my father around and, and going to race circuits uh, from when I was a kid and, and idolising him. So uh, the natural progression from that was to, to want to get behind the wheel. So when I was uh, 15, uh, I had a go-kart purchase for me, but that was it. I, I had a lot of brothers and sisters, so there wasn't a lot of money, money going around. So it was, we bought it for you, and now you have to keep it running. So I had to learn how to build it maintain it, etc. So that started my, my career and I did go-karts for many years, never at a very high level, but at a state and a club club level and I had a varied amount of success there and uh, learnt my racecraft in go-karts. I pride myself in, in the way I go racing and I go racing quite uniquely. There's um, you know, I'm a one-man band uh, and that's down to every extent. So uh, I, every race car I've ever driven, I've built, prepared, um, repaired, um, I've done the sponsorship, I do the logistics, I do the, uh, the flights to and from the event. I grit my teeth um, and uh, blood, sweat and tears to get to every race meeting. So I know I can, I can feel uh, good in the fact uh, that uh, I can sit back and say that every lap I've ever done in any race car, I've completely earned. Zedanet Racing, of course, they have some pedigree. Jonathan won the NGK Racing Series, he's a champion. I think they, they took a step back from the National Series to focus on the 24 hours. You've got to take the hat off to it, it's not an easy project. You probably could have just bought a seat with an with a international team. Truth be told, it's, it's, it's a tough, tough challenge. It's just not, you know, arrive and drive and win. There's going to be a lot of blood, sweat and tears for them to actually uh, succeed. But uh, you've got to applaud the bravery of the project and, uh, yeah, the ambition. Like Humer, Jonathan has experienced success as a driver for other teams in the past. But this time, the challenge was much greater, to win with his own team. As a team together, I mean, I'm very proud of everyone who's involved and very appreciative. You know, people are not getting paid to do this. It's, it's from a, a labour of love that we have all these guys involved. One of the most important things about the 24 hours is planning and strategy. We rely on Ian for this in terms of tyre changes, in terms of fuel stops, in terms of code 60s, and making sure that the drivers are absolutely aware of what's happening on the track at all times. It's a really, really critical and pivotal role to the team. Every team needs a, a good combination of mechanics, managerial and admin side. I handle the admin and the strategy and I liaise with the mechanics during the event and, and during the testing before so that we know what the car is capable of and hence what strategies we can employ during the event to cover any eventuality. The, the highs can be high, the lows can be exceedingly low. The important thing is not to let your head drop, keep battling on and it's not over till the chequered flag finishes. Two years ago, we were involved with a different team here. Um, and one of the class competitors was 10 seconds a lap faster than us. But we kept the car on the track and John drove the last stint as it happened. He brought us over the line 27 seconds ahead of second place. We were leading the class, we weren't leading the class. We knew the car was catching us, but we kept a level head, we kept John informed and we beat a professional team. That's, that is the ultimate high, and that's what we live for.
Now we have almost exactly seven weeks and things are starting to get a little bit stressful. We're still awaiting some parts to arrive, such as our gearbox is due to be shipped from the US in a few days, and also brakes. I've been chasing the supplier and he's not answering, so I don't know where the brakes are. I hope they're coming soon. Okay, there's a few complications, but in the end, I think it'll work out. We've got to go and meet our sponsor, so at least we have to look professional, so let's do it. Our relationship with Jonathan uh, developed during the course of the stadium in Alain. We knew that Jonathan was involved in racing, 24-hour racing. We knew he had success last year. Uh, we liked the idea of uh, BAM International being on a racing helmet on a guy that you know, has won races. and uh, We felt that this uh, would meet our image and uh, w where we wanted to go as a company. We have a meeting with uh, Medio Rotana to discuss our contract because again, we have an agreement in principle a number of months ago, but we haven't signed the contract yet. They're very kindly putting up our drivers during the event who are coming from Scotland and from Australia. This is really fantastic. So. We need to go and make sure they're happy, you know. I said, okay, it's time, we need to, uh, said, no, we need it's, to check uh, and see where we stand. But the, the ingredients are there, if we can just have the right chef. I know we have you guys for catering. We need the same with the race and it will all go well. Thank you okay. so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Ciao. Thank Good you. Luck. The youngest driver on the team is Graham Davidson, an oil and gas professional more used to driving the powerful GT3 cars in sprint races, he will need to adapt to the smaller engine and slower pacing for longer periods of race. I think it's just something that I've grown up with, I've, I've always wanted to be the best at whatever, whatever I've done, so whenever I've tried something, if I've enjoyed it, I'll continue to do it until as good as I can be at it. And I won't settle for fourth or fifth. You know, I have to be on the, the podium. Once I'm on the podium, I'll keep going until I'm first. And that's the same for cars now as it was for bikes when I was younger. And day to day, Graham is it's totally different. It's sat behind a desk. It's in an operational yard with pipes and pumps and oil rig equipment. It's it's a complete contrast to being at race circuits. With track day at the Autodrome scheduled for tomorrow, Graham will be getting his first taste of the car and the opportunity to familiarise himself with the track. Very apprehensive, uh, anxious, not sure what to expect. It's, it's going to be a, a long flight tomorrow and, and I want to get to the track and get the first practice out of the way, settle my nerves and you know, catch up with the guys and all the rest. Guys, uh, where's the car? I got to the track this morning at uh, 7 o'clock and I got a text message saying quick come to the garage, we've got problems. So I got here and then uh, found they'd had to take the subframe off, the sump out, flush the valve cover. So we're just putting it back together again now, taking a bit of debris out of the oil, fingers crossed problem solved. After the diner they routinely check the oil, you look in the oil for any metallic particles, any other debris, anything that shouldn't be there. And they found some uh, green paint chips maybe, maybe from the valve cover, we don't know and some uh, metallic particles, so that's enough. You don't go like that, it's a lot easier to stop the problem, take the sump off, flush the engine, and off to the track shortly. You know, it's almost uh, two hours into the session now. We're really in a bad shape here and we need to get this car on track today. It's absolutely critical. While Graham was out on track in Jonathan's road car, 
The race car was finally ready to be transported to the track. Tempers were frayed, and patience was running low. Time was also running out on the session. Jonathan wasted no time in taking the now modified car on its first outing on the track. Today wasn't a particularly good day for us. We um, came with every intent of doing a full three hours testing and things didn't go particularly well from early in the morning and then subsequently on track. I did four laps which allowed me the opportunity to test the initial handling, the initial power and the initial uh, setup of the car. But unfortunately when I handed over to Omer on his first out lap, the car completely stopped. I was expecting this because uh, this is the first time we've taken the car around after a year and then we've taken it all apart. So things, you know, they were supposed to go wrong. This was a test that everything is functional. Now the next time around when we come, it'll be all calibrated and they'll work in sync. And Graham flew all the way from UK, didn't get an opportunity to test the car, so really for me that's a huge disappointment today. Unfortunately there was an electrical issue with the car that meant that it was stuck out on track and couldn't be recovered in time for me to get out, so a uh, bit disappointing, but I did do a lot of laps in the Audi, so I'm pretty comfortable with the circuit. Uh, it's really time to get serious. We have to increase our physical uh, stamina, mentally we have to prepare. There's going to be a lot of incidents, a lot of unforeseen events will happen and we have to be ready to prepare for them. This type of workout can help, it prepares us, prepares the body, uh, prepares the mind also, so it's, it's really good. Obviously, if you're, uh, you're fit in the car, um, you're going to be consistent and, uh, and fast and you're going to make the right decisions at the right time. If you're struggling physically, so much of your brain power goes into you know, trying to keep yourself physically aware that you become mentally unaware and, and then you have mistakes. My fitness regime uh, leading up to an endurance race, cross country uh, running, which I, I've done a fair bit of. I do a lot of boxing. Boxing really does get the heart rate up. It, it's good for your, uh, your core strength and your upper body and uh, it's something I love to do. I guess these sports and, and hobbies, the, the biking and the, the car racing, is, is a great way to, to vent angers and frustrations. It's like a punch bag at the gym. I don't want to let the team down, so I need to make sure that I'm fit for it. I need to keep up the, the work at the gym, keep on the bike, and I think I'm young enough and healthy enough that it'll be all right. It is now just days before the race will be underway. All teams have safely arrived in Dubai, and it is the night before scrutineering. Team Zetinet's car, however, has still not made it to the track. They are carrying out final adjustments to make sure everything is in order for inspection by the FIA officials. Last minute panic now. Yep. Everybody wants to do something, but you can't because uh, the guys at the alignment, they're doing the alignment. We want to help them, but we can't, just to speed up the process. So it's, the car has reached that stage where it just needs to finish certain things in which not everybody can help. It should have been finished like two weeks back or a month back, I'd say. Yeah. It turns out to be a long, laborious night for the team as they pour over every detail, nut and bolt. The car was finally ready to be scrutinized by next morning, but with one slight problem, a cracked windscreen, which could have tragic consequences. The scrutineering was at last underway, and the FIA official was notoriously strict about applying the rules to the letter. The team steered clear of his way as they anxiously watch their car being inspected. And then, the moment they had all been waiting for, the car gets given the all clear, pending a screen change. But the team don't have a spare screen, and without one, they cannot race. They need to find a solution quickly 
so they can make it to practice. Last night when the guys were finishing some small piece of work, they broke the windscreen. And uh, we don't have a windscreen, we're supposed to be out testing now. Uh, it's already five, ten minutes into the test session and we're behind. While other teams were making the most of the practice session, teams at Inet were feeling increasingly frustrated in the pit, listening out for any good news from the glass company. Their fate literally hung in the hands of the glass cutters. Because this car is right-hand drive, we're in UAE, which is left-hand drive, and this car was never ever sold in UAE. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think they're cutting the third screen, and what, you know, are they going to give up soon, or are they going to keep going, or what? Your fingers crossed. We are cutting a screen which is not for this car. So we are taking a bigger screen, putting our screen over it, and cutting around it to make it the same size as our screen. They've tried twice now and broken two screens. They're cutting the third one now. So I don't know, will they get, you know, sooner or later they're going to give up and say, we can't do it, guys, sorry, you have to go somewhere else. It was already more than halfway through the session when the new screen finally did arrive. But mechanics needed time to fit the glass and for it to set, making it too late to go out on the track. Gerard and Graham have still not driven the car, let alone on track, and Umer only has half a lap under his belt. This was an opportunity missed, putting the Zetanet racing team squarely on the back foot. To be honest, uh, it was a really laborious and uh, taxing day. At this point, it feels really tough and it hasn't even started yet, so tomorrow better be a, has to be a better day. Although we've not been out on track today, you know, I've been up here uh, looking at the lap times of the, of the other cars in our class. Uh, we have a, a bogey time where we can't cross, if we do we get put up to the next class. One of the cars has done that, which is the Mini, and that's a fast car, we know that's a fast car. Maybe they were just pushing to see what it could do, they could throttle it back tomorrow. You know, it's the tortoise and the hare routine. The, the car that won the class last year was third slowest in qualifying in its class. The only lap you need to finish first on is the last lap of the race. It's constant observation and management throughout the race, which is why once the race starts, I don't leave here. I will sit up here and just keep an eye on the lap times of ourselves and the competitors. Most of the teams, they are professional motorsport teams. Okay, yes, we have DAS with two or three guys, but they're not, they're not a racing team. They're a, a car maintenance uh, garage. The autodrome gets off to a very foggy start on qualifying day. Visibility is seriously hindered as teams converge for pilots' briefing. With almost 400 race pilots and their entourage in attendance, this is by far the biggest gathering in the history of the 24-hour series. Teams at Inet check in and take their place in the conference room to listen to instructions and rules from race organizers and FIA officials. qualifying about to begin, cars started to roll out onto the pit lane, looking to go on track and outrace each other for a better spot on the starting grid. Zetanet Racing Team opted to sit out for a while to observe the time set by their competitors in the A2 class. The fastest lap time was soon set by the 111 car of Krennic Motorsport. The number 86 Mini, setting lap times above all others yesterday, is today posting times much slower than Team Lap 57 and the 111 Renault Clio. Now, with target times to beat in hand, Team Zetanet decide it is time to go on track and give it their best shot. 
the decision is taken to go with Gerard at the wheel to fight for pole position. The only professional driver in the team was about to show what he could do with the car. Gerard wastes no time in setting a good pace and quickly starts posting some very respectable times. As the tyres and brakes reach optimum temperatures, Gerard comes to within striking distance of pole position. Things are finally looking up for Team Zetanet. The car is running fast. The team have adapted to the car and Gerard is only seconds off pole. Ian advises Gerard that he is in fourth position behind the Mini and all he needs now is a bit of clear track with relatively little traffic and he can mount his attack on pole. But disaster strikes again. Despite Gerard's efforts to pick up the speed, the car slows down to an ambient pace and is obviously in some serious trouble. With position 4 on the grid now guaranteed, Gerard limps the car back to the pit. Whatever the problem is, it needs to be diagnosed quickly and the car needs to be race ready and back on track in the shortest possible time as in just a few hours they will have the only chance to get some night practice before race. The team must now pull together and not let their morale drop. On the last two laps we had uh, some issues with overheating so as you can see behind now the guys are going to remove the cylinder head we're going to replace it from a spur engine we have. You know, the biggest concern is that we don't know why it's overheating, to be honest. Uh, we don't know, is it a tuning issue? Is it a air vent issue? You know, we'll get it fixed, we'll get it, no problem. But in the back of our minds now, we don't know what is the cause yet. So this is a problem, you know. So. As it turns out, though, Engine trouble is not the only problem the team have right now. Uh, we had an issue from a regulation point of view because the, the car came in with a problem. The guy started immediately working on it, but the chequered flag flew. And when the chequered flag flies, you go into what's called park fermé, which means you can't, you can't work on the car. You have to put tools down because potentially you could be gaining a, an advantage to the car. While this was happening, I ran down to the stewards to find the clerk of the course. We had a bit of a discussion about why we were while we're not there, while we're working on the car and what sort of penalties can apply. They can go from disqualifications, all kinds of not, not good stuff. So what, what we agreed was that he would allow us to continue with the repair to get out on track and basically the times we set during qualifying uh, cancelled and we have to start at the rear of the grid tomorrow. We have got the pace today so, you know, okay. not all bad. With time ticking away, the mechanics are still trying to find the cause of engine failure. Night practice has already been green flagged while the team are hoping to identify and fix the problem and get the car out. Even only if for a short while, as Graham and Gerard have never raced at night and this would be their only opportunity to get some practice before the race tomorrow. It soon becomes apparent the changing the cylinder heads is not going to solve the problem. The spare engine is brought in and the team looks set for another long night in the pit while other teams reap the benefits of driving in the dark. It is now the early hours of the morning and the team have got the car race ready again in time for the morning warm-up just before the race. They are now about to see if the night's work was in vain or not. Gerard is given the honours to take the car out on track first and warm it up. He hands the car over to Graham who doesn't waste any time putting it through its paces and setting the fastest time in the class. Ian is finally smiling. Right, so that's been uh, warm up just finished, and the good news is we've just finished first in class. Uh, Graham did a couple of time laps, very, very consistent. So we're going to use this now to, s 
to, to set the, the target time for each lap. So all the hard work last night of changing the engine, doing the suspension setup has obviously paid off. I will have a debrief to see if we need to make any more changes, but you know, we're all happy at the moment. It's more stable on the braking, so it's, it's getting better. Yeah. Was a, lot, a lot better car than it was just It is finally time to race. As the crowds pour into the stands, the Zetanet racing team are about to step up to the challenge. Having spent months in preparation, the moment of truth was now before them. And it was time to make it all pay. Sitting on the grid with a hundred other cars around you, the noise, the ground shaking, the adrenaline, you have to know that you have a team behind you. You're not only racing against other teams, you're racing against the clock, tactics, strategy, fitness both mentally and physically, and you have to go and you have to deliver. Cars will now do two formation laps. These are slow laps and overtaking is not allowed during these laps as cars must keep to their grid positions. And a rolling start will then be given once the officials are convinced all cars are in their correct grid placings. Ian and Heike look on from inside the pit as the cars are about to get rolling. They are just as nervous as Jonathan. The Works GT cars make up the front of the field, while the A2 class cars are at the back. Jonathan will be starting from last position on the grid and will have his work cut out to move up the ranks. The lights are off and the race is on. The Dubai 24 hours is now underway. Race cars and pilots are now hurtling towards the first turn. This is a sight to see, as never have so many raced on this track at once before. It is a record for a 24-hour endurance series start. Jonathan soon has his sights on the number 120 Peugeot. He will need to find the right place and push hard to make a pass. For automobile enthusiasts, today is a day made in heaven, as the fleet of supercars including Mercedes, Ferraris, Aston Martins, Porsches and BMWs are now fighting for supremacy on the track as they go neck to neck into the turn, almost making contact. Jonathan in the meantime is preparing for his first assault on the car in front. He soon spots the opportunity and dives inside on the turn to make his first pass on an A2 class car. Adnan watching from the pits is a happy man indeed. This is the team's first move up the ranks. Jonathan settles in behind the trailing trio of two Clios and a GT86 as he sizes up the challenge ahead. Jonathan moves to the outside to challenge the Clio, but a Code 60 is called as there has been an incident on track. During a Code 60, cars must retain their positions and not exceed 60 km an hour until the green flag is waved again, signalling the restart. Jonathan had just started finding his pace and rhythm when the Code 60 was called. He needs to retain his concentration and make a good restart when the race is green flagged. This will be a good opportunity for overtaking. As cars are bunched up, a good restart could give him valuable position. The green flag is out and Jonathan is lightning quick to react and quite literally catches the trio ahead napping. He makes the triple pass on the inside to take him into 82nd position. He has now climbed from 89th on the grid to 82nd on track. If the team can keep this up, all the hard work they will have put in will surely pay off. The GT86 Toyota, however, is not happy about losing the position 
and gives quick chase. The fight is now on between Jonathan and the 124 Toyota. Jonathan makes a gear shift mistake, costing not only valuable seconds, but the position gained, giving his adversary the chance to pass. But Jonathan knows this track and its braking points better than most drivers on track. He breaks late and dives to the inside again to regain the position lost. The pit lane Toyota attacks again on the straight, using the advantage of higher top end speed and makes a move to the inside as Jonathan comes across to shut the door, leading the GT86 into the turn as both cars get caught in passing traffic by the bigger classes. The GT86 Toyota fades away. Half an hour into the race, and ZNet Racing Team are now safely in 80th place. Having started in 89th place on the grid, this is encouraging news indeed for the team. Suddenly, all memories of the past few days seem a long distance away. He is now driving in position 13 in the A2 class, with his sights firmly set on the Clio of Apo Racing. Coming down the starting straight again, and the number 27 Mercedes SLS is now inches from the bumper of the ZNet Honda. As Jonathan bears off the apex on turn 3, the team ZNet Honda is hit from behind by the 27 Mercedes SLS of Car Collection Motorsports. The car is in trouble. Jonathan pulls away from the racing line and off the track. He slows down as frustration is riding high. He can do nothing but watch all the work he has done up until now fall to pieces as cars pass him by. Just when the team was finally and firmly on their path to success, the gods above had other plans. Bad luck has come back to haunt them yet again. He has no choice but head for the pits. Ian is visibly stressed as the number 48 car of ZNet Racing Team limps down the pit lane to be met by the crew. The car needs to go inside for inspection and repairs. Time is precious, but this is not a sprint race and there is still plenty of time left to make up for time lost. The team, however, must hurry to save every single second as pit time must be reduced to a minimum. Tensions are high and Jonathan and his co-drivers can do nothing but wait for the mechanics. The team now feels the enormity and the gravity of the challenge ahead. This was never going to be an easy task, but bad luck and other people's mistakes, they could well do without. The accident happened in turn three. As I was going into turn three, I was on the racing line and I got hit from behind on I don't know what hit me. The guy said it was a Porsche, I didn't see it. Uh, it has damaged the rear suspension arm. Uh, we've Luckily, we have a spur. We just got it a few days ago and uh, they've swapped it. There is a few differences between the suspension left and right now, which may cause a small issue, but we have to go back out, we have to keep racing. I stepped out of the car because of the time it will take to repair, and I can't get back in now because I stepped out. These are the rules. So Graham will go in now, and he will do a stint. Maybe better, he's fresh. I'm a little bit tired after that first uh, shock factor, but I'll be okay later, you know. As the crew work feverishly on the car, valuable time is being lost to adversaries. They cannot afford to lose any unnecessary time. It has taken the better part of 10 minutes to change one of the rear suspension arms and the team has already slipped back into last position. Graham will now need to go out and do his best to get the ZNet racing team back into the game. Not only is the pressure now on Graham's racing abilities, the team's hopes lie on his shoulders. The car is now ready to go racing once again. The team have done a great job in changing the left rear suspension arm in under 10 minutes, keeping the team in the race and hopes of a podium place still alive. In a race that takes 24 hours to complete, 10 minutes can be negligible and easily made up with some good driving and strategy. Almost all teams will encounter problems. This is part and parcel of a 24-hour endurance race. Graham leaves the pits carrying with him all the team's hopes as the team celebrate the quick fix and morale is high once again. Pilots by now have all settled in and found their rhythm. The pace is now reckless as engines, tyres and brakes are all up to racing temperatures and teams are all clocking very respectable times. 
Graham tries to find pace in the car and work his way through traffic. Racing an endurance race with many different classes and hence speeds is not an easy task. Graham is more used to shorter races in more powerful machinery and unfortunately he has not really had enough time in this car to familiarise himself. He has nonetheless set the fastest lap time in the A2 class during his short outing earlier in the day. He now needs to find that pace again to start catching up with the other A2 class cars. There is something wrong with the car though. Graham is slowing down. The nightmare is back. The team are perplexed as he heads straight for the pits and the car is immediately taken inside. Graham stays in the driver's seat, not wanting to lose his stint. To be able to solve any problem, the crew must first diagnose it, and this could take a while. Heike tries to get the lowdown from Graham. In a frantic effort to identify the fault, Graham meanwhile remains in the car, hopeful he will be back on track very soon. But based on the information provided and the initial checks carried out by the crew, things are not looking good. Faces tell all. Graham reluctantly vacates the driver's seat and hopes are dashed in the team's Etinet pit area once again. The bad luck that has been haunting them all week will not relent. The team do their best to put on a brave face and tackle the problem, but nerves are wearing thin as morale hits an all-time low and is clearly reflected on the faces. The team are now looking at the prospect of another engine change, a process that could easily take up to two hours. This means that they would have no realistic chance of podium, and at best, they can be also rams. To move even one place up the field, they will need to rely on other teams having accidents and incidents. The team are devastated. Uh, from yesterday we had the engine failure which was caused by temperature, overheating of the car. With the engine change we replaced all the radiators and the cooling in the car. We had an incident 30 minutes into the race where we were hit by another car, damaged the rear corner of the car, which meant we had to come into the pits and what, what we feel was that in the garage when the car was in there was a lot, of, a lot more heat build up, which would normally be washed off when you're driving and you have air going through the radiators. So we think that may have started to overheat the engine, even though it was off, the residual heat. So we've gone back out again. The damage is probably already done, so the pressure was increasing and overheating, which caused another engine failure. So we've gone to replace the engine again. The new one has just arrived, so hopefully within two hours, two and a half hours, should be back on track. With the engine which we've got now, it's last yesterday's engine we've rebuilt, but we've taken it back to stock fittings, we've detuned it back down to lower horsepower for longevity and reliability so that we can get out and get maximum time on the track. The team has done an amazing job. This is their second change in two days. So we'll go back out, we'll keep, we'll keep fighting. As the hours pass and chances fade, the sun also begins to set on the Dubai Autodrome. On track, the racing is as fierce as it has ever been. But in the pit lane, things are different. Team Zetanet are not the only ones working frantically to get back into the race. Many other teams share the experience as the pit boxes are now full of professional and amateur teams sharing the same fate. It doesn't matter if you have the best driver or the best mechanic in the world. At this stage of proceedings, the name of the game is staying in the game. You know, we've been upbeat, we've been hopeful, we've been uh, positive all day. It's really, really getting to, to us now. It has been a really tough struggle to do this race so far. And, uh, but nobody's given up yet. We're going to keep going. We will finish this, we will put the engine in, we will go racing, we will see what happens. But we really need to get on the track and see. The car is race ready yet again. The crew have performed another miracle on the back of hours of labouring and sleepless nights. The engine has been replaced and final adjustments made. To the delight of the crew, it fires up first time. But, unfortunately, out of the six hours since race has begun, the team have now spent a total of three hours and 20 minutes in the pits. 
their hopes of any result have now faded. Teams at Anet are now resigned to the fact that they are racing purely for the honour of finishing this race, regardless of position. Graham, yet again, needs to rise to the challenge as he will lead the team out onto the track. He no longer needs to push the car to the limits or chase others. All that is needed now is a smooth, relaxed drive to preserve the car for the next driver so the team can cross the finish line. Graham has never even practiced in the dark before, let alone raced. But with the pressure off, all he has to do is coast along and maintain a relaxed pace to hand the car over. To get any result, the team must first finish. Graham must look out for the engine and gearbox and try to keep temperatures down as best as he can. And this is exactly what he is doing. He is keeping to a very similar pace with the other cars in the class, keeping close to the Mini's pace, but not racing too hard. As Graham gets more and more laps under his belt in the darkness of the Dubai Autodrome, the Zetanet racing team can now relax and reflect on the last few weeks. The pressure is finally off, and all they are aiming for is a finish. As Graham comes off the starting straight and into the turns one and two, there is quite visibly a problem with the car. Smoke is not only pouring out of the exhaust on the back of the car, but filling the inside of the car. Fearing something is on fire, Graham pulls over and announces the situation to the team. I've had this pull over and the car was smoked out and something's hot and I need to get out. The crew in the pit are devastated, yet again. As Graham evacuates the vehicle, the team's body language says it all. Never wants to quit, their determination and stamina are now being put to the ultimate test. The car is towed into the pits, but there is no longer any urgency about the crew's movements. Resigned to their destiny, they pop open the bonnet one more time to get to grips with the problem at hand. The team are destitute. They know that sooner or later, they will have to accept defeat. They have already performed above and beyond their calls of duty. Emotions are high again, and the team is visibly teary-eyed when faced with the facts. We've had to come to the realisation that, that we, we can't continue with the race, we've had to retire the car. It's a bitter pill to swallow at the minute. We are, it's a sobering time for us, and it's cruel, and they say motorsport's cruel, and it has been to us this time. Thank you to everyone for all your inputs, all your efforts. It really was uh, the hardest working team I ever saw. Uh, the most dedicated team I ever saw in terms of effort. So I can't ask for any more, never could. And uh, I appreciate everything. A great bunch of people, every single one of you, you know. And uh, all of you really, really excelled a lot and uh, really proved your dedication, your focus, your real blokeness and uh, that's not something that everybody has so highly appreciated really. The next morning, with the race still in full swing, teams had settled into their positions and were heading towards the finish line. In the top class, the Mercedes SLS of the Black Falcon Racing Team was comfortably leading, while the Mini in the A2 class had relinquished its lead to VDS Racing due to mechanical failure only laps before the end. Such is the cruel nature of motorsports. Team Zetanet turned up in full force to take their place on the pit wall and take in the final laps of the race. It was time not only to celebrate the winners, but also to reflect and ponder on the weeks gone by. So it's the end of the race. Um, we really had anticipated and expected to finish. It, it wasn't to be, we were far from it. And uh, uh, looking forward, we have to sort of you know, grab ourselves together 
think about the positives of the event, think of how well the team worked together and, and build on that specifically. This is the, the best thing we can take out of this event is the real camaraderie and uh, team spirit that was developed. So it's good for us that we move forward on that basis. The team looked on and cheered as the victors took to the podium. It was not to be their turn this year. You know, we thought we had the right ingredients, we thought we had the right car, the right gearbox, the right engine specifications, everything, even the right drivers, but it just wasn't to be this time. So we can't really think about podiums anymore. We just have to think about starting from scratch, getting the car back, uh, doing a shakedown in March and making sure that we, we start racing again and build up the confidence again. Otherwise we quit and we're not going to do that, so we start positive.